Hey guys, welcome. In this video, I'm gonna show you everything you need to know to get saving and loading working in your game. I'll show you methods to save it in a clean, readable format if you wanna give your players the option to play around with the numbers. And I'll show you how to save it in an encrypted format as well. I'll also show you how to do it synchronously and asynchronously as well, because you might need either depending on your needs and how your game is set up. Ready? Let's go. So here's my scene. I've got a player with some coins and some different power-ups right here that he can pick up. There's also enemies that spawn randomly around the scene and we have multiple scenes set up in this project. So let's start with the player's position because that is definitely the easiest. I'm gonna open up my player script here and there's a lot going on here in the script but none of it matters because we're just gonna go right to the bottom outside of the class and set up a public struct called player save data. And literally the most important thing to remember, we must add the system.serializable attribute in here. Otherwise this struct will never save and it can just be really frustrating to try to figure out why. Now inside we only need one thing, which is a vector three to hold our position, that's it. Now just up here inside the class, but right at the end, I'm going to add a save and load function passing in that struct as a parameter. Now again, very important, we add the ref keyword in the save function. Normally when you pass in a parameter, it makes a copy of whatever your reference for that parameter is, but when you use the ref keyword, it uses the actual reference, not a copy, which means we can read and write data to this struct using the ref keyword, which is exactly what we're gonna do. So for our save, we'll set our parameters position to be whatever our current transform.position is. And in the load, we'll do the opposite. We'll set the transform position based on the struct's data. So now we need to create a new script to actually do the saving and loading, and we'll call this save system. Now this will not be a mono behavior because it's not gonna live in our scene anywhere. And in order to read and write our save file to our PC, we're going to add the system.io namespace, which stands for input output. So first we'll set up a struct called save data and make it serializable as well, very important. And we'll add our player save data struct in there. And now let's set up a static variable for that struct. So in order to save, we need to call the method that we just set up in our player, and then we need to write that to a file and save that file. So first we're gonna make a little helper method which will return a string, and this is for the file path. So we'll say application.persistentDataPath, which is a predetermined path based on whatever device you are using. I will leave a link down below so you can see it. Then we'll call the file save, and we'll choose the file type as well, which we can make literally anything we want. So I'll just say it's a .save file. Then return that string. So now let's create our actual save method. First, we need to call the save method we set up in our player. And in my game, I have a reference to everything I need to save from in my game manager. And by the way, if you set yours up the same way, I actually recommend going to edit, project settings, script execution order, and adding game manager and putting it all the way to the top to ensure that it's awake method is always called first. Okay, so I'm going to set up another method here called handle save data and call our save method. And again, if you have the ref keyword as a parameter, you need to pass that in when you call the method as well. So now in our save method, we'll create the actual save file by saying file.writeAllText, call our helper method for the file path, and we'll use the JSON utility to write it, passing in the save data. And by the way, if you change this to true here, it will format the save file and make it really human readable. If you leave it to false, it's still readable. It just gets rid of all the spaces and crams everything together and saves just a little bit of space in your file. So whether you want to use that is your call. Now for load, we do this in the reverse order. So first we grab the save file and then make our struct equal the result of that. And then we call our load functions from our other scripts and call load like that. Okay, perfect. Now, just to test it out in my game manager, I have set it to save when I press zero and load when I press one. So let's test. So I press play, move over here, save. And now if I play again, let's try loading it. And there we go. Also, you can see it's created an actual save file here. And if we open it up, you can see it is nice and readable. So that is working. So moving right along, we'll do the player upgrades next. 
So I'll open up that script. So you can see in order to unlock upgrades in this game, I have these bools set if they're unlocked. And when we actually unlock them, we set that to true. And then we set our script associated with that ability to enabled as well. So same deal as before, we'll set up a struct with those bools, not forgetting the system.serializable. And then a save and load method based on that struct for a parameter. So the save is just applying our bools to the struct's data. And in the load, we'll actually call our unlock methods here if they are in fact unlocked when we load it. Now, again, you can see I'm giving a reference of this script to our game manager here. Now back to our save system, it's really easy to add new stuff in here now that we've got all this set up. So we'll add our player upgrade struct here and then add our save method to our handle save data and then add our load method to our handle load data here. And that's it, so let's test again. So I'll go over here and collect the bomb upgrade, save, then enter play mode again and load and we moved and I'm still able to use the bomb ability. And you can see the result of that save file here as well. So with currency, we have a visual element because it's tied to the UI. So how do we handle that? So I'll open up my currency manager script, add a struct in there, and add in our save and load method. And the only special thing to do here is call whatever method you need to actually update your UI element in the load method. In my case, I have a helper method here to do that for us. So by now you can obviously tell that the load method is just taking the logic from the struct and applying it into our game in whatever way we need it to work. So back to the save system, we'll add in that struct and add in the save and load methods. One more test and then we'll move on to something a little bit more complex. So I collect a few coins, you can see it updates up here. We save, we go back into play. Obviously we're at zero now, but we load and it goes back to where it should. So let's do the spawn manager next. Maybe in your game you wanna save how many enemies you have in each room and load those in each time you load up the game. Now in order to do that, I did a very basic implementation of this. I have a separate serializable class here for the number of enemies to spawn and which enemies to spawn in. I turned that into an array up here and spawn in however many enemies we need based on that array. We also have a list here to track how many enemies we have in the game. So this time I'm going to set up two structs, one for the position and a game object reference to which prefab this is supposed to spawn in. And then another struct, which will just be an array of that first one that we set up so that we can hold as much of this information for as many enemies as we need. So this is the one we'll actually be passing in as the parameter in the save and load method. So let's set up those methods. Now, before we can go any further, we need a way to be able to match which game object belongs to which prefab, which can actually get a little bit confusing to do because instantiated game objects are just copies of prefabs, so you can't just check to see if they equal each other. So what we'll do is we'll use a dictionary to compare the two game objects to each other. And whenever we spawn an enemy in, we'll map that copied game object to the enemy prefab that it came from like that. So back in our save, we'll set up a new list and we're gonna increment through it, except we actually wanna increment backwards, which is gonna make more sense in just a sec. So we set our index to the count of the list minus one, check if our index is greater than or equal to zero and then decrement it. That's how you go backwards. And if it's not null, then we'll create a new enemy save data struct, passing in the position and prefab, and then add that to our list that we set up at the start. And if it is null, then we remove it from the list because that's probably an enemy that we killed. That right there, by the way, is why we're decrementing backwards. You can run into a lot of problems when you're removing items from a list while you're incrementing up since the actual count changes as you remove things. But going backwards gets around that problem. Then we'll actually send that list to our data array and we can use dot to array to make that work. 
So for the loading, we are spawning in enemies in our start function here. And I wanna leave this here just in case I'm hitting play from within the scene, but I also want loading to be an option as well. And I don't want them to conflict with each other. So what we'll do is we'll clear our existing enemies as well as our list and dictionary. Then we'll spawn in the enemies from our struct data that we load in, making sure to update the list and dictionary afterwards as well. So again, we go back to the save system, we add in the new struct and add in the save and load methods. The only difference for mine being I want my enemy spawn manager to be optional, so I'll actually just search for the component here, and if it's not null, then I'll load it. And I should do that with the save as well. Okay, let's test again. You can see our enemies here. We'll save and open it back up and load. And they look like they're in the same place to me. That's awesome. Okay, now you will notice that I have this door over here. And if I go through it, it takes me to another scene. So how the heck do we handle something like that? So there are a lot of different ways that you can handle this. Every method has their pros and cons, but I do not recommend that you use strings unless you literally never ever plan on changing the name of your scenes ever. What I like to do is create a little script called scene data SO which is a scriptable object that's going to hold a unique name. Doesn't matter what it is, it's not the same name, it's whatever you want it to be, and the scene index. So I have four scenes in my game here, so I'll make four of those and give them unique names and pass in the right indices. Then I'll make this other tiny little script called scene data, which will just take in one of those scene data SO files. I'm also gonna fill in my game manager reference to it here because I will be needing that soon. And the deal with this is we're going to have to have one of these in every scene that we might ever need to be able to load into, okay? Each scene has a unique file. Now on my game manager game object, which is set to don't destroy on load when my game boots up so it's always available, I will add another little script called scene loader. This one is gonna take in an array of those data files. We're also going to need a dictionary so that we can find our scene index by our unique string that we set up. So when we first open this, we'll populate the dictionary. And then our helper method will try to get the scene index by our unique string. And if it's successful, we'll output it to this variable that we'll call scene index. And then we'll load that scene from that scene index. And if we can't find anything, then we'll put an error in here so that we know we just forgot to add one of our little files into the array. Now in our scene data, let's open that up. We'll make a new struct with a string for the scene ID and create a save and load method as well. And when we load, we'll call that method that we set up in our scene loader. And then back in save system, we'll add in the struct and call the save and load methods as well. So before we can test it, I gotta add in all of our little scene data files here or it will not work. So I'll go into my second scene here and save. And then I'll go back into play mode and load. And there we go, we are loading into a new scene. However, you will notice now that our enemies are not being recalled correctly. And the reason for this is that we're loading the enemies, spawning them in there, but then a new scene loads, which unloads and destroys all of those, and then this start method gets called in the new scene and it's all just fresh again.
So for scenarios like this, and for many, many other examples, you might want to set up your save and load asynchronously so that you can wait for certain things to finish first and control the flow and just the order of operations to how you see fit. So in our save system, let's do the saving first. So we will need to add the system.threading.tasks namespace. And I'll set up a private static async task called save async. So we'll call handle save data like always, and then await and pass in everything the same as before, except call write all text async here. Await literally means that when we call this method, it will freeze execution of this method until this line is complete, but it will do that without blocking the main thread so that the game will continue to run smoothly, basically. Okay, now we'll set up the method that we're actually going to call, and we want this to wait as well. Now, before we do the loading, I need to set up one more method back in our scene data file. We'll make this load method. And actually, there's one more thing. We want to call that load scene by index method, but we also need an async version of it. So here's that. And now we'll call that here. But in this scenario, I actually wanna wait until the entire scene is completely finished loading before I resume loading in everything else, okay? And for all the stuff that's changing, like the player changing positions and all that stuff, you can easily block that behind a loading screen or even just having a faded screen to black and then fading that in, something like that. But basically I want to ensure that this start method in my enemy spawn manager has run because when we call load over here, it removes any if necessary, which is how we want it. So we need start to run before this load method gets called. So we set up a new task completion source. create a new action variable and pass those results to the action, which will also unsubscribe to the scene manager's scene loaded delegate to avoid being run multiple times. Then we actually add it to the delegate. So basically this event fires whenever a new scene is fully loaded and then it unsubscribes itself to make sure it only gets called one time. So back in the save system, we'll make a load async method. And we'll pass in the string stuff like normal, then await our new async handle load data method. So here you can see that we can control the flow of everything. So first we load our scene and await that. Then we have this other method that waits for the scene to be completely and fully loaded to make sure that all of our awakes and starts on everything that exists in that new scene has been called before we continue on with the rest of our load function, right? So then after that, then we do everything else. Then get rid of this line here. So back in our game manager, I will just change the save and load methods to our asynchronous ones, which will require me to add that tasks namespace. And now to test, I'll go into scene two, I'll save and open it back up and load. And now we enter the new scene, but our enemies are also in the correct position as well. So really quick here, I'm gonna show you an encryption method as well. I'm just gonna leave this code open on the screen here. We are using encryption methods from the system.security.cryptography namespace. And the only requirement for this method is that our encryption key here be 32 bytes long. And I just had ChatGPT spit this key out for me because I'm lazy and it works fine. Okay, so these are helper methods that take in strings and encrypt them and then take encrypted strings and decrypt them. So all we would have to change is back in our save system and we'll use our first helper method to encrypt our string. And pass that into our write all text format. Same thing for the async. And in the load methods, we'll pass in the encrypted string and use our helper method to decrypt it and then pass that into our struct. 
everything else stays the exact same in this script. Now you can see when we save it, if I open up the file, it's complete nonsense, you can't read it, but I can still load it up and everything works totally fine. So encrypted or not encrypted is totally up to you. This is just one of many possible ways of doing it. And by the way, as a thank you to my patrons, I have this project available on GitHub with the addition of a main menu with multiple save slots that you can choose from. You can delete the files. And if there's no save data, the load button is grayed out. It shows a little icon for how much money you have in the save and load files. I left it very bare bones on purpose so that you can take it and run with it for use with your own games. So thank you so much to all of our generous patron supporters. And if this template looks interesting to you, then go check it out over on our Patreon. That's all I got. See you next week, guys.